following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Since we have begun a new year, I felt that it would be beneficial for us to talk about <clears throat> change. In Western symbolism, we have an old tradition of representing the change of one year to another as the old man representing the former year, handing off his responsibilities to a newborn child. And although in recent decades that mythology of Western culture has been more and more ignored, it bears in its bosom an important meaning that is derived from the ancient esoteric tradition. And that is the relationship between the moon and Saturn. The old man of that new year and old year tradition really represents Saturn, the ancient god, who in his original name is called Kronos, the god of time, the god of death. Kronos symbolically is represented as an old man who carries a scythe. And he represents the passage from one phase to another. He represents time and change. He is the seventh of the seven primary planets in esoteric traditions. In the esoteric knowledge, and in, in many places around the world, there are seven fundamental laws or forces that are symbolized and described in different ways. And those seven end with Saturn. They begin with the moon. The moon is that stellar influence or, or planetary influence that creates that initiates, that begins. This is why the moon in this Western mythology is represented as a baby, a newborn child. And it's interesting that around this time of the change of the new year, we also celebrate festivities related to death and resurrection, specifically the 25th of December, which is a symbolic date in which we celebrate the birth of Christ, not only in the Christian tradition, but in many ancient religions. The sun god is born on the 25th of December. That birth, that emergence of light into the world is made possible through Saturn, through death. We see this cycle of birth and death in everything. A cycle that is inescapable. A cycle that is the very foundation of nature. 
death opens the doorway to life. And we see that in the emergence of any living creature. For that living creature to emerge, there must have been death. And this is why we gave an entire course about death and its mysteries. So that we can understand that to have life, we must have death. And to fear death is to be in ignorance. Death is an important part of the process of living. Through death, we have change. And as I mentioned in that course, none of us would be alive if it were not for death. The simplest example of this is that today, in order to make it through this day, you must kill. Something must die for you to live. You need to take into your organism minerals and water, plants and perhaps animals. And you will kill them. You will destroy them. You will consume them. And they will die so that you can have life. This is the basis of living. Every breath that you inhale, every mouthful of food that you take, Every time you chew and swallow, you are killing, you are destroying, you are creating life for your organism. This process is inescapable. To be alive, you must kill. But of course, you have to know how to kill in balance with nature, both your inner nature and your outer nature, the nature around you. This is why we learn how to eat responsibly and respectfully. To eat and take only what we need to live. To not take more than we need. This is the ancient way. A way that has been lost by society. We now want to take more than we need. And hoard it. Or indulge in it. Or try to make a profit from it. This is why we have a great imbalance, not only in our society, but in our bodies. This is why we become overweight. We develop gluttony. And we develop many health problems because of this tendency to hoard things, to want more than we need. And fundamentally, this comes as a misunderstanding of life and death. So in the Gnostic tradition, we seek to deeply comprehend the actual nature, the objective truth about life and death, what they truly are. Not theoretically, not religiously or philosophically, but practically right now. Our very moment-to-moment -moment existence is managed by laws. And in order to sustain our existence, we need to work in harmony with those laws. So in the Gnostic tradition, we study the laws of nature in our bodies, in our minds, in our environment. In order to accomplish that study, we need a particular point of view. We need to have a consciousness that is able to pay attention and that is able and capable of seeing things as they truly are not as we want them to be or wish they would be or hope they could be, but as they actually are. This is a rare quality. It isn't something that one receives by inheritance. It is a point of view that one has to develop and know how to manage. To begin to develop that, we start here and now. Being in the body reflecting on the nature of the body that we inhabit and starting to examine the relationship between that perceiver and what is perceived. Commonly, this is a relationship that we take for granted and we never analyze. We assume that what we perceive is true and real and valid. 
And we never question the perceiver. And we never analyze or study how the perceiver perceives. And this is the cause of our suffering. This is the root of our suffering. Our lack of knowledge about perception. In Sanskrit terminology, this lack of knowledge about our perception is called avidya. In most translations of Asian scriptures, that term is translated as ignorance. But when we look deeper at the etymology of the term avidya, we see something very interesting. It has two primary components. The first is the letter A. That letter A is a prefix that when attached to another word implies without or lacking. And the rest of that term is vidya. And this word, this phrase, can be translated in a variety of ways, but in the context of this lecture, the most important one is that it means knowledge. But it doesn't mean knowledge as book knowledge, theoretical knowledge, or philosophical knowledge. It means conscious knowledge. Knowledge that one has experienced. Knowledge that is irrefutable. In other words, dharma, truth. Something that's real. So this word, avidya, is somewhat similar to its common English translation, ignorance. Because even in ignorance, we see a similar construction. We see the prefix I. And after that comes three letters, G-N-O. That G-N-O is the same prefix in the word gnosis. So that I implies lacking, something missing, without. So to ignore is to lack knowledge. But in this context, when we say to ignore, we usually use the word ignore as something willful. For example, my child is being very irritating, so I'm ignoring them. That is a willful choice. So when we use the word avidya and we talk about ignorance, we generally, most people that read scriptures and that study philosophy, assume that this ignorance is a lack of willfulness. It, they, they assume it means a lack of education, a lack of instruction. But in fact, it is willful lack of knowledge. And we can prove this for ourselves by analyzing our behaviors today. We willfully avoid seeing the truth. We willfully, consciously, intentionally avoid the facts. This is very unfortunate because truly it proves that avidya, ignorance, is the cause of our suffering. We avoid the facts of our lives and instead we grasp after dreams, hopes, good intentions, fantasies. But we avoid the truth. We avoid the facts. We try to cover up what is plainly in front of our face and distract ourselves away from seeing the fundamental facts. All of us have our own mechanisms that we rely upon in order to avoid facing the true reality of our lives. Some of us utilize our lifestyle. Maybe we claim that we're too busy. We have too many responsibilities. We have to care for our family. We have to save money or make money. We have to do this, we have to do that, and thus we don't have the time. 
Or perhaps we justify ourselves by saying, the world is already too corrupt and there's nothing I can do about it. It's hopeless. Or perhaps we justify ourselves saying, it's all in God's hands, not mine. We have many excuses, explanations, justifications. We have many behaviors and habits that we use to avoid the truth. Some of us put on a shirt of spirituality and claim we're doing our best. We are, quote, spiritual people. Some of us put on the shirt of politics or of commerce and claim that those outfits that we wear are our effort, are our way of trying to approach reality and truth, trying to solve the mystery of life. Some of us avoid it outright by engaging in any number of pursuits in life, getting an education, making achievements or accomplishments, accumulating products or wealth. Be honest and sincere with yourself and ask yourself the question, have you truly comprehended that you will die? Do your behaviors reflect a genuine, cognizant understanding that the moment of death will arrive and it will not be according to your schedule? Do you live your life from day to day fully taking advantage of the opportunity of living in order to prepare yourself for the moment of death? Are all of your activities geared towards preparation for that inevitable outcome? How much of your time and energy is wasted in frivolous or even harmful activity? We don't like these kinds of questions because they reveal places in our lives that we don't want to look. And they point out habits and tendencies that we don't want to give up. But the fact is, we will die. It is unavoidable. It will happen. And you will not expect it. So, this is why we gave the course about death. But there's another reason we gave that course. It's not only so that we as individuals can initiate a training in ourselves from moment to moment to keep our consciousness in a position in which when death arrives, we won't be surprised. We won't be caught off guard. But instead, we'll be prepared and be able to transform that experience into something positive instead of something terrifying. This is possible. It has been done. It can be done. But one has to be trained. And truthfully, you have to train yourself. No one can teach you that. Because no one can see all the intricacies of your mind except for you. That training is really, really important. Not only for transforming the experience of death, but transforming the experience of life. And here's why. Life is not going to go according to our plan. I hope that isn't too shocking of a bit of news. Those who are a little older are probably starting to realize that more and more. But the youth have that wonderful gift of youthful uh, hope. Maybe it's a little bit of naivety but it also gives them great energy to try. Whereas the older ones who've tried and failed and faced the challenges of life and the unpredictability of life often give up and resign themselves to just watching the world in despair. 
This training to be attentive and present, continually watchful in oneself from moment to moment, not only is preparation for the moment of death, but is a mechanism, a tool, that allows us to transform the process of life. And this technique, this skill, is becoming more and more important. What we need to understand is that we are not the mind. When we analyze this relationship between perceiver and perceived, we have to see that we are this body. This is a physical body that we all have. And even though there are slight differences among us, structurally, physically and psychologically, we have these basic factors that we need to understand and analyze and study and know very deeply how they function, how they work. The first is to simply be aware that the perceiver is not the body. The perceiver is not the eyeballs. It is not the ears. It is not the thoughts. You can perceive without thought. You can perceive without eyes, without ears, without taste, without touch. Perception is still there. That root perception is consciousness, cognizance, existence, a state of being. And there are many, many degrees of consciousness, levels, infinite. Not only infinitely narrow and limited, but infinitely expansive and perceptive. Our level of conscious development is very, very small. Far smaller than we assume it is. The consciousness is more capable than we can even imagine. But without training, we can't realize its potential. This training begins here, now, in this moment, starting to become aware of oneself, observing the body, observing the relationship between perceiver and perceived. The body is not the perceiver because we are perceiving it. Moreover, inside the body, there are many, many, many details. All the organs and systems. All of its functions. And really all of that, we synthesize as a brain. And we call it the motor instinctive sexual brain. Motor instinctive sexual brain. Really, this is a center of activity that has three primary parts. A motor center, an instinctive center, a sexual center. These are three machines that function through the body, that fulfill their roles in order to give us existence. The motor skill or motor center is what gives us the ability to walk around, to do things, to talk, to eat to ride a bicycle, to go to work. The instinctive center manages the base functions of our life, to eat, to survive. The sexual center is the center that drives all of the energy in us. Not only reproductive, but spiritual. Our spiritual and sexual life are rooted in the sexual center. So being aware of being in the body is the beginning of being aware of this center, this brain how our body functions, from the easily observable to the very difficult to observe. It's easy to observe oneself walking, using your hands and feet, adopting different postures as you stand and sit. This is very easy, although we don't do it. We're generally unaware of being in the body. We forget the body. 
totally distracted by the mind. Self-observation must encompass awareness of the body, observation of it. And then we begin to observe thoughts. We call this the intellectual brain or intellectual center. So begin to be aware that thinking is not the perceiver either. Because you can perceive a thought. The thought does not perceive. A thought is a concept. It is not a perception. It is a record. It is an image, a memory, a concept, a theory, an idea. So now we're observing two things. The motor instinctive sexual brain and the intellect. The brain that's in our skull. But there's more to us than that. Because we also have emotion. We have feelings. We have longings. We have fears and anxieties that aren't necessarily connected to physical sensations. And they aren't necessarily connected to logical thoughts. But we sense them and feel them in our heart. So then we have this third brain, the emotional center. The emotional center is not the perceiver. The intellect is not the perceiver. And the body is not the perceiver. Don't take my word for it. Observe yourself. Perceive these, and you will begin to see that you are not these three. You are the perceiver. Your true nature is deep in perception. But your perception is being clouded by these three. Your perception is clouded continually by impulses that are arising from your body, from your motor instinctive sexual center. Your perception is clouded by the impulses and feelings and sensations in the body. You feel tired. You feel hyper. You feel hungry. You feel thirsty. You want to lie down. You want to run around. You want to eat. You don't want that food. You want this food. You want to have sex. You don't want to have sex. You want to survive. You want to die. All these impulses that arrive almost, it seems, randomly, chaotically, without any control. This includes many types of addictions. Addictions to food. Addictions to substances. Addictions to sex. It includes addictions to psychological processes also that become deeply rooted in the body. Some of us become so addicted to certain forms of entertainment that that addiction is in the body. Because the body thrives on the sensations that that entertainment produces. For example, pornography, soap operas, lots of sports, very violent activities like video games, or competitive sports that are quite violent. We might be interested in them in the intellect, and we might like the feelings of them in the heart, but the addiction to them is in the body. We become very clouded in our perceptions by the sensations that we experience in the intellect also, by theories, by concepts. We may have been told our whole life the idea or philosophy that life is like this. And when we start to experience that life is not like that, we have conflict. All of us grow up in a certain type of culture and we receive a certain type of education to see life in a certain way. And when life is not that way, we have a conflict and we suffer. We may have been told that life is about getting a marriage partner and a house, and kids, and a car, and a job, and a savings package, and then you get to 65 and you retire and go live on the beach. And it's not happening for us, and we suffer. But we don't observe it. 
we don't realize, I'm suffering because of this idea that life is supposed to be a certain way. We need to comprehend that life is not an idea. And it does not conform to our ideas. It conforms to our karma. We also become deluded and confused by sensations in our emotional center. Longings and cravings in the heart. A parent loves their child and wants the best for their child and wants their child to be the president, the prime minister. But that child only wants to watch TV and play games. The parent suffers in their heart. That is not the true nature of the parent. It is a desire, it is a longing in the heart that clouds their perception of seeing reality. It may be that that child, that their destiny doesn't correspond with the concept of the parent. It may be that their destiny is to be something totally different. And that parent has to learn to let the child do that. That perception becomes clouded through the heart is true for all of us. We may feel that we deserve a certain type of life, a certain type of partner, and we don't have that, so we suffer. We may feel that we need and want a certain type of attention or affection from someone, and we don't get that, so we suffer. In all of these cases, we see qualities, sensations in the three brains that cloud our perception and that cause us to not see life for what it is. This is the fundamental problem that everyone in humanity suffers from. We call it by many names. And the solution is to learn to observe these three brains and to recognize the difference between perceiver and perceived. To start to establish that distinction in our perception. Let me make that perfectly clear. What I'm talking about is not a theory to put into your intellect. It isn't a feeling to build in your heart. It is not a sensation to feel in the body. It is a way of seeing. There are many people who study self-observation and they understand the theory very well, but they don't observe themselves. And there are many people who study self-observation and they feel in their heart that they understand it, but they don't observe themselves. And there are many people who study self-observation and build physical habits and tendencies that they believe are self-observation, but they are not observing themselves. Self-observation is beyond the three brains. It is a way of seeing. It is a manner of perception. This is the most fundamental training to truly transform your experience of living and dying. And there's a reason why I'm emphasizing it today. It's not happenstance. It isn't just because I had nothing else to talk about, which could be true. But the reason that I'm mentioning this today, specifically at this transition from one year to another, is because there is a great deal of energy in motion. Our entire world is poised to undergo an incredible transformation. And we are not going to like it. I know we all have a lot of beautiful ideas and theories about a coming golden age. And maybe the next election will make everything better. But the fundamental reality, we are not willing to see. And we need to see it. Because if we don't, 
our suffering will be compounded. We begin by learning to see ourselves as we truly are. And through that perception, not a theory, not a sensation, but perception, we also can start to see the world around us for what it is. Not for what we wish it was or hope it could be, but what it is. This has extreme significance. But in order to truly empower it, to truly understand self-observation and grow in self-observation, there's another component that is vital. We begin here, learning to be present, learning to remember to be in the body, observing ourselves. That alone can take years of training because our habits are so deeply ingrained. But this is the most important foundation. We talk about many things in this tradition, many concepts, many teachings, many practices, but without this, you will get nothing. You can be transmuting your energy all you want, but if you don't know how to use that energy, you will get nothing. We learn to use it through directing attention, through managing our consciousness from moment to moment. Self-observation is that first step. But to empower that, to take the knowledge that you acquire from self-observation and properly use it, you also need self-remembering. We can say that self-observation is a somewhat focused energy. It is the ability to recognize and experience that perceiver and perceived are not the same. There is a difference. Now, philosophically, this is going to get a little bit confusing, but if you practice this, you will start to understand it. So don't let your mind get caught in it. This first stage is to recognize the difference between perceiver and perceived. The second stage is to realize they are the same thing. It sounds contradictory, but it isn't. Because in the second aspect, in self-remembering, you remember God. You remember the being. When you remember your innermost, when you remember God, it isn't a thought in the intellect, thinking, oh yeah, the theory, the concept of God. And we imagine whatever we imagine God happens to be in our mind. No, that is not self-remembering. It is also not to experience a sensation in the heart. A love, a longing, an anxiety, a missing, something in the heart. Oh yeah, God is like this. God is love. I love God. That's not self-remembering. It isn't to be the type of person who experiences a lot of bhakti or devotion and to feel your heart inflamed. This is good, but that is not self-remembering. It also is not sensations in the body where we feel tingly, like, God is here. That isn't self-remembering. Those are sensations in the body. Self-remembering is conscious awareness that absolutely everything is God. That the presence of God, the perception of God, is everything. Your intellect cannot hold that. Your heart can't hold it. And your body can't. Because they're all inside of it. To see it, you have to get beyond the three brains. You have to get beyond yourself. Self-remembering is an expanded awareness that encompasses self-observation, surrounds it, energizes it, fuels it. There are many students in the Gnostic tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, in Zen, in Taoism, who learn about watchfulness, they learn to be present, but they never remember themselves. And their practice becomes dry. To remember oneself is to be actively engaged in perceiving the nature of the perceiver. 
And this is when you begin to see that what you perceive is not distinct from the perceiver. Philosophically, it sounds contradictory, but experientially, it is not contradictory. Even science is recognizing this. If you've studied physics, the physics of the last hundred years or so, it's all leading to this, something that's been known in spiritual traditions for thousands of years. Perception is the basis of existence. How you perceive. Science even states now, if there is no perceiver, there is no event. The event is only real when it is seen. That's science. Sounds like Buddhism or Taoism. Sounds like Confucius or Lao Tzu. That's science. That's gnosis because it's true. Your relationship with what is perceived determines your reality. This is the fundamental question then. How do you relate to what you perceive? By habit, we've only learned to relate to what we perceive through our three brains, because we perceive through our body, through our heart, through our intellect, and we've never learned how to perceive without them, beyond them, controlling them consciously without interference. And that's what self-observation and self-remembering working together will teach you. I can't teach you that. You have to learn it through practice, through effort, through remembering constantly to do it. Let me give you some examples of what will happen if you learn this. The way we are now with our habits now, if we have a difficult experience, we really suffer a lot. For example, if someone we love does something or says something that hurts us, it affects our perception of everything. Especially if they do something that goes against our will. We want them to do A, B, and C, and they don't do any of it. We get really mad. We get really hurt. Our heart's in pain. Our body gets tense. We can't sleep. We can't work. Our mind is racing. Why did they do this? How could they do this to me? Doesn't he know that he should have done A, B, and C? And we fight and we argue. The problem is our perception. We're not observing ourselves. We're not remembering God. And we're not seeing anything in that situation as it truly is. In other words, we have no comprehension. No real understanding of what's happening in that scenario. So we feel hurt. A person who is capable of self-observing and self-remembering would experience that situation in a completely different way. That loved one who does A, B, and C the completely wrong way, we would observe that, see that, experience that. The pain might be there because we're not getting what we want. We might feel disappointment. We might feel hurt. But we will also feel love. We will also feel comprehension. We will understand that person is doing it because of this and this. This is happening because of my karma. This is happening because of this and this. Whatever the reasons of that scenario may be, we will understand it. Our judgment will not be clouded by our desires, by our longing to control the other person, and by whatever intentions, good or bad, that we might have. That's a very simple example that you can begin to receive benefit from this kind of training immediately. Learning how to transform your experiences of life so that you're not suffering so much all the time. This gets more important, though, when we start to put it into the context of society as a whole. 
this training becomes more important. Spiritually speaking, this training is critical because we don't understand and know not only our own karma, but the karma of our society. As we are now, we're taking everything for granted. All of us assume that we will live for another 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And in that space of time, we can pretty much do whatever we want. And we have the opportunity to acquire as much as we want to acquire and go where we want to go and do what we want to do. And we all have this fantasy. But that fantasy has nothing to do with reality. It is a fantasy that has been foisted on us by our culture, who's only interested in getting money, and more money, and keeping us confused so that we won't see what's really going on here. Moreover, it keeps us in a state in which we don't realize and recognize the undeniable fact that we will die, and we don't know when. And at that moment of death, every action that we performed is calculated mathematically in order to determine what happens to us next. Our good intentions don't fit into that equation. Only our actions. What we did and did not do is reduced to a sum. And that sum propels us forward into our next scenario, whatever that may happen to be. Our current scenario is derived that way. Through the accumulative actions that we've engaged in up to now. And what will happen to us later today and tomorrow and the day after that will be determined by everything we've done up till this moment. So when we analyze that, we recognize this fundamental state in which we are constantly being fooled by our perceptions of our mind, of our heart, of our body. And we are always being manipulated by our sensations, by our fears, by our anxieties, by our pride and lust and gluttony and greed. Then we can pretty easily determine that the outcome of all of our actions will also be suffering. Because we've behaved in a way that produces suffering. We've behaved through ignorance, and through desire, only focused on our wants, on our needs. This is why we suffer now, and this is why we will suffer tomorrow. That accumulative or cumula cumul accumulated series of actions and consequences produces a stream of energy in nature. Some people like to call it soul, thinking that it is their real identity. And in some traditions, they call it mind stream. Really, it's a stream of karma that our consciousness is trapped in, wants to be free of, but can't free itself because we are relentlessly attached to materialism, to lust, to pride. So let's imagine, briefly, a stream of energy moving through space on a vertical plane. That stream of energy is our energy. It is the, the accumulated actions and consequences of everything we have ever done in every lifetime. And all of that is condensed and synthesized in this exact moment, right now. All of that is defining who you are, where you are, and everything that's confining and binding you. Everything. The type of body you have, the type of mind you have, the type of culture you have, your interests, your fears, your longings, your anxieties, your limitations, your skills. Everything that you experience as myself is really this stream of energy that is condensed right here and now. Everybody wants to know about their past lives. 
and they want to go to another person and pay them money to find out about their past lives. You don't need to. If you seriously examine who you are now and learn to meditate and analyze who you are today, that meditation process will unlock the keys of who you have been because who you were determined who you are now. It's quite simple. The problem is we ultimately really don't want to see it because who we were it's not John the Baptist and Mary Magdalene and Joan of Arc. We weren't Jesus' sister or mother or daughter or whatever. We were people like we are now, ignorant, foolish, blind. We made a lot of mistakes, and that's why we're still suffering. We have a lot of pride, that's why we're still suffering. We have a lot of arrogance, a lot of anger, and that's why we're still suffering. Observe your mind, your heart, your body. See it for what it is. That observation here and now, observing what's happening here and now, is a doorway. It is a key that can unlock everything that exists in nature. Everything. Everything. The Greek oracle said, know yourself and you will know the universe. That knowledge of self is not theoretical. It isn't intellectual. It isn't a belief or a theory. It is not a sensation. It is not in the three brains. It is in the consciousness. It is in perception of the truth. If we look at that stream of energy... Of course, right now, we don't remember much. When we try to imagine the stream of energy that made us who we are here and now today, we really don't remember that much. It's hard for us to truly conceptualize that flow of forces. It's hard for us to remember where we were an hour ago and what exactly we thought and felt just an hour ago. We have to actually work at it. What was I doing precisely 60 minutes ago? Where was I standing, sitting? What was I thinking and feeling? What was I doing? We don't remember. We can't remember three hours ago. We can't remember what we were doing when the body was asleep. We certainly can't remember much of yesterday or last week or last month. We have a very, very fragile, weak memory. And there's a single reason why. Because we don't pay attention. We're distracted. We're either off thinking about things all the time and barely paying a percent, any attention to the moment, or we're off feeling, indulging in our feelings and feeling about this, and what do I feel about that, and how do I feel about this? Never present. Or we're distracted by sensations in the body. Never present in observing our three brains and our environment. In other words, we don't see anything of states and events. Our psychological state in relationship with our external event. We never really notice. So at the end of the day, when we think back, gosh, what did I do today? We have these big gaps in our memory. I can't remember what happened. When I got off that bus, I guess I walked to work. Somehow I got to work, because then I was at work, and I don't remember. Or yesterday, did you call me? I don't remember. We don't remember, because we don't pay attention. This is proof. If you really observe yourself and remember yourself, you will remember everything in detail. And it will be overwhelming how much you remember. If you really want to remember your past lives, if you really want to be awake in the astral plane and be able to go to visit temples and talk to masters, you need this. If you cannot be awake here and now in your physical body, you cannot be awake here and now, in the fifth or sixth dimension. It's more subtle. To be awake in the internal worlds, you must first be awake here. So develop the skill here. Regardless of how extensive our memory is, if we can only remember bits and pieces of our current life, at least through 
analyzing that flow of energy, we can start to surmise its potential momentum forward from this moment. In other words, imagine this horizontal line. We are here in this moment. Everything we ever did throughout all of our previous lifetimes is that stream of energy behind us, leading to this exact moment. Where will that energy go now? What determines it? It isn't your boss. It isn't your spouse. It isn't your children. It's not the city you live in or the country you live in or the language you speak. It has nothing to do with your education or how much money you have in the bank or don't have. Your movement forward in life, in evolution, is determined by your perception. By how you see and what you see. It's determined by your consciousness. In other words, if you continue the way you've always been, barely aware of anything, just being pummeled by the forces of life and driven here and there like a leaf on the wind, then your life going forward will be exactly the same, except that all of a sudden, at a given moment, you'll be dead and you won't know it. And you'll be living the same way in limbo, propelled by karmic forces of all your previous actions and either pushed to a new womb or pushed to devolve in nature. This is the most likely outcome for the vast majority of humanity. Because the collected karma of the entirety of humanity is too heavy. Because all of humanity is living this way. Asleep. Propelled by desire. Driven by lust and pride. Compelled by sensations and the addiction to materialism. Thus, the entirety of humanity is on the precipice of a tremendous transformation. It has already begun. And it's going to get worse. I know we don't want to hear that. We don't want to see that. We want to believe things are going to get better. But the facts point to the opposite. If we extend this imaginary line to the past outwards and we collect all of humanity and we look at the collective actions of the entire race on this planet for centuries and centuries and centuries and we look at how much greed there is, how much violence, how much lust and anger and pride and gluttony and envy and fear if we look objectively at the entire planet and we see how that stream of energy is moving, how can you possibly entertain the idea that things will get better? When month to month, year to year, they are getting worse. We don't want to see it. We want to distract ourselves with TV and fashion and politics and video games. We don't want to face the fundamental objective reality, which is that our suffering is worsening, our poverty is expanding, our pollution is expanding. It's harder and harder to get clean water, clean air, pure food, worldwide. There are more wars. There is more slavery. There is more rape and violence and killing than there ever has been. The scientists reject that with all their charts and figures and data. But in our heart of hearts, we all know it's true. We feel it, and we don't want to deal with it. And thus, this stream of energy of humanity, this stream of karma of cause and effect, is bearing consequences that are starting to be fruitful. The consequences are happening. They are emerging. Nature is fighting back. Nature always seeks to balance energy in order to preserve itself. Nature does not care about us. Nature doesn't care about any civilization or species. It kills them to preserve itself. 
It's happened before, and it's happening again. As a humanity, as a race, we have unbalanced nature on this planet. With all of our atomic testing, nuclear blasts, pollution, with our raping of the land, our raping of the earth, our destruction of the oceans, our killing of life forms worldwide. We have infected the entire planet with our illness, and the planet is revolting against us. The planet is on a different time scale than we are. The planet is a living organism, a conscious being, who has compassion, who has love, but also acts in accordance with the law. This planet has already destroyed four civilizations before ours. And it will destroy us. It's only a matter of time. This line, this imaginary line that we've been talking about, is the line of time. It ends in death. It always does. It always has. It always will. Our body will die. Every civilization in history has died. So will ours. The question is, who will be prepared to take advantage of that death, to transform that death consciously, and utilize it for the benefit of everyone? Even Jesus died in order to resurrect. The Buddha died in order to resurrect. Every great master dies in order to have the resurrection of the spirit. Humanity must die in order for a new age to emerge, for a new humanity. Humanity cannot go forward with all of its pride and anger and lust. It cannot. It is an abomination. It is an offense to all that is divine. Humanity is bound by impurities that cannot rise to heaven. And the only way to remove those impurities is through death. As individuals, we have a choice. We can engage in that death consciously, willingly, actively engaging in killing the ego in ourselves, pursuing our anger and killing it, pursuing our pride and removing it, pursuing our lust and eradicating it. We can consciously choose that. That is a psychological death. And through that psychological death comes a psychological resurrection. The soul is born. The spirit is born. A master is born. A Buddha, an angel. That is the only way to make a Buddha or a master or an angel, is through a psychological death. And that's why all the great stories of all the great masters have them die. They are beheaded. They are crucified. They sacrifice themselves for the benefit of all. Unfortunately, humanity as a whole does not want that. Humanity wants to take the ego to heaven and go to heaven with all of their lust and all of the anger and all of the pride. And this will never happen. It cannot. So the only way to those superior levels is for those aspects of our psyche to die. Nature is participating by helping to advance the karma, our karma, and helping us to suffer so we can pay what we owe. No man knows the hour save the Father. But the hour will come when this planet undergoes a great transformation. In the coming days, all of us will witness many painful things. We will experience 
events the likes of which have never been seen before. And we have a choice. We can avoid it and bury our heads in the sand and watch television and debate politics and stay with our addictions to frivolous, materialistic things. Or we can learn to transform the experience and learn and change. It is extremely likely that in the coming days, our lives will be dramatically changed and that the life of comfort and ease that we have longed for and wanted will be denied to us. It is highly likely that the comfort and ease with which we go from day to day will be gone. And we will have to suffer and struggle more and more simply to get by. In that process, we have a choice. We can experience that in our habitual way and be afraid and resentful and angry and greedy and gluttonous. And we can try to hoard things for ourselves and buy guns and food and store it in our basement and try to take from others and try to behave, in other words, the way we've always behaved as humanity, poorly. On the other hand, we can learn to transform the experience consciously, to learn from it, to rise above it. This training that I've been explaining to you to self-observe and self-remember has a supreme significance. Firstly, because it is the doorway to developing a truly spiritual life. The doorway to real spiritual advancement is not in the future. It isn't in the projected line of life going forward from this moment. It is not there. Your spiritual advancement is not in the future. It isn't tomorrow. It isn't after you finish this big project. It's not after you get your degree or after you get married. Your spiritual future is not there. Your spiritual future is not after you find a good school or temple or church to go to or, or after you read that book or after you learn this and that skill in meditation or self-remembering. It isn't there in the future. The doorway to spiritual advancement is here and now. Right now. And it will always be here and now. It will never be in the future. It will never be dependent on any external circumstance. It is always, always dependent on your state of being right now. Your state of consciousness determines your spiritual life. You choose. In this moment, whether you are deluded by your thoughts deluded by your feelings, deluded by sensations and impulses in the body. You choose. It is a choice. When you decide to sit down and be hypnotized by the TV or the computer screen, you have chosen to be hypnotized. When you choose to experience and indulge in your fear of the future, in your worry about what will happen, you have chosen that fear and clothed yourself in it. When you experience your longing for material security, your craving for wealth, for a sense of being safe, you have chosen a delusion and wrapped it around yourself. You have chosen to be asleep. The entrance to a real spiritual life is to choose to be free. That is a choice. It's a choice you make here and now, continually, to be free. To free your heart and mind and body from the delusions 
of the external world and the interior world. You choose with your conscious will to have your perception free or jailed. It's up to you. The one who has their consciousness jailed is like all of us. That person suffers because they are caged in all of their fears and pride and anger and lust and envy and greed. And that's all they know. The one who chooses to be free refuses to be bound by any thought, any feeling, any worry, any sensation, and instead observes them, does not fight them, does not resist them or indulge in them, but is in balance, conscious, aware, non-reactive, observing, conscious, continual. And that person experiences something completely different because that person experiences the actual nature of time, the reality of time, this line of time, because in reality, that line does not exist. That time that we all worry about, I don't have time. I'm running out of time is an illusion. We all think, I've only got so much time to build my soul, to create the solar bodies. I only have so much time until I die. You don't know how much time you have. I only have so much time to get my degree and go to college and get a house and a wife and a boat and a car, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To build my career, to get famous. There is no time. Time is not real. Time is a way of perception that is rooted in desire. The one who truly self-observes and self-remembers escapes time. In other words, they open the doors to a vertical path. That vertical path emerges from this moment right now. It is not in the future. That vertical path is the path of the being the path of God, the path of the consciousness. That path goes two ways. If you learn to observe yourself, to be in the present moment, to be in your body, to be here and now, to observe thoughts but not indulge in them, nor resist them, to observe emotion and to not indulge in it or repress it and to observe sensations in the body, but to not be driven by it or avoid it. In other words, you achieve Tao, to be in the middle. The middle path between aversion and craving, neither craving or avoiding, neither chasing or running away, being. When you learn that, you then are learning to truly observe the three brains objectively and to not be victimized by them, to not let them control you. So your thoughts will come and go and your feelings will come and go. And that person says this mean thing and you feel that pain in your heart, but you don't react and the pain arises and you feel it and you watch it and then the pain goes away. And then it's like nothing happened because you didn't indulge in it. You didn't react to it. You didn't respond in kind to hurt the other person so they would feel what you felt. In other words, you comprehended. The same with sensations in the body. You feel the impulse for the orgasm, but you don't indulge in it. And if sensation goes away and you no longer want it, You've comprehended something. Sensation, thought, and feeling are impermanent. Truly, 
ultimately, they do not exist. What truly exists is the perceiver. That is our true nature. The consciousness that sees. We have lost knowledge of our true nature because we grasp at a false sense of self defined by a sense of security in our intellect that people think of us a certain way and we think of ourselves a certain way, so we are safe. A sense of security in the heart that we feel a certain way, so everything must be fine. A sense of security in the body that we get the sensations that we want, so everything must be hunky-dory. That is all a lie. None of that is real because it will all die. People's opinions of ourselves will change like the weather. We can't rely on how we feel because it changes like the weather. We can't rely on sensations. We can't rely on a house and a car and a wife and a spouse and an education. We can't rely on our society. We can't rely on a president or a prime minister or a king or queen or a priest. We can't rely on anything outside because it is all impermanent and subject to karma and it will all pass away. You can't rely on money in the bank. You can't rely on your children, on your parents, on your friends. You can't rely on anything, anywhere, but one place, your true nature, which is perception, which is the being, which is God. To learn that now will aid you a lot in the coming months and years. Because humanity is going to suffer a lot. All of these games that humanity is playing with politics and media and money will be revealed to be what it is. Fruitless, useless, impermanent, unreliable. We suffer because we try to rely on things that cannot be relied on. All of us want to rely on money in the bank, our political system, our education system, our children, our family. And we suffer because really you can't rely on any of them. They will all pass away sooner or later. And the moment they're taken, we suffer a lot by our own fault because we invested our sense of security in those things. We chose those things to make us feel safe. And that was a mistake. The process of approaching this teaching is to recognize that. To not put our Trust and faith in things that cannot be trusted and do not last. But to invest our time and energy and our spirit and our consciousness into something eternal and permanent. That is consciousness, the perceiver, which is inside. Why is this so important? It's because this line, the vertical path, goes two ways. From this very moment... When we talk about time and we talk about energy, we're all making a choice. How we use our energy, how we use our consciousness, how we pay attention. Every time we clothe ourselves in our pride and we feel ourselves, I'm good or I'm bad, we've chosen to invest energy in that pride. We've chosen to sleep, to be hypnotized. In other words, we have moved down the vertical path because we have trapped consciousness in a false entity. Every time we indulge in lust and we indulge in the sensations of lust and we feel like, this is wonderful, lust is great, we've invested consciousness in that animal desire and it becomes trapped in that and we have stepped down the vertical path. And the same is true of envy. When we see what someone else has and we want that, We've invested energy in envy, 
and trapped our consciousness in it. And then that envy will pursue us. Remember that thing that you saw that you wanted? Remember, you really want that, right? You really want that. Now you have to go get a job, you have to make money, or you have to get money from somebody to get that thing that you want. And that thing, that thought, that desire, that emotion keeps afflicting you constantly. I really want that thing. I really want it. Now I have to do this and this and this and this to get it. It might be a dress. It might be shoes. It might be a car. It might be a house. It might be a situation. It might be a girlfriend or boyfriend. Something that we envy that someone else had or has. And then we invest everything into getting that. Because we think it will make us happy and secure. We're wrong. The sooner we begin to realize that, the sooner we'll change our suffering. Every time we indulge in those desires, we step down on the vertical path. We descend. And that's why the entirety of humanity is descending. To ascend, we need to liberate the consciousness from every kind of desire. Every kind. To not be bound by any desire. To not be bound by pride, anger, lust, laziness, gluttony, greed, envy, fear. The one who is able to accomplish this is liberating the consciousness from the ego. They are retrieving their soul, saving it from the abyss. We train ourselves to do this from moment to moment and from day to day through our daily experiences. When someone criticizes us, we can choose. Do I indulge in this anger or do I comprehend the criticism? Maybe they're right. Maybe what they said is true. If it isn't true, why should I get upset? Because it's not true. If it is true, why should I get upset? Because it's true. So if you're upset, you're fighting reality. You're denying something. You're avoiding something. When you're upset, something in your mind is in conflict with reality. In order to solve the upset, the pain, the suffering, we always try to change the outside. And we always fail. We may get the thing that we want, we may go around and tell everybody, that was a lie, it didn't happen like that. We still up, end up unhappy because the fundamental nature of the problem was not changed. That fundamental nature is our perception inside. If I know who I am and I know what I did and I did the right thing, anybody in the world can say I did the wrong thing and I won't care. It won't bother me at all. Because I know in my consciousness that I did the right thing. And no one can take that away from you. That is the authenticity of consciousness, of the being. That is the type of certainty and serenity that we need to face what's coming. There will be wars. There will be death. There will be disasters. This world is going to change. Sooner rather than later. Purge from your mind the illusion that things are going to improve. Do not look to the future for something that does not exist. Look to yourself here and now. Analyze who you truly are and change for the better. Learn to know your being. Whatever happens, whether it is at your house or down the street or in the next country, you can handle it. If you remember God, if you forget God, 
you will suffer a lot. But if you remember your being and trust your being, if you can be present here and now, not putting the mind in the future or the past, not getting identified with your longings and fears, your cravings and desires, but being here and now, trusting God, listening to your intuition, you can be helped, you can be aided, you can manage. Let me give you an example. If a dramatic situation happens and someone is terribly injured and the crowd of people around that person is in a complete state of panic, how are they going to help the person? If they're all scared and afraid and, and panicking, no one will have a level head. And there's a good chance the person will die or their suffering will get worse. In order to help that suffering person, there needs to be someone there who is not identified, who is not emotionally engaged, who is not afraid, but is who, able, who is able to be calm and skillful and solve the problem. Similarly, we need that to deal with our life. If our mind is confused and conflicted and trapped in desire for security, for wealth, for fame, or for an escape, we will be in conflict and be unable to see the reality for what it is. And we won't be able to solve our problems. And we suffer from that right now. All of us have all kinds of problems that we can't solve because our mind is in conflict. Because we're identified with our problems. If we learn to not be identified, to accept what God gives us, and to work for what we deserve, then we would not have this problem and this suffering. There is a guarantee given by God to all of those who faithfully serve God, their own innermost. And that guarantee is given in every religion by different names. Samael M. Viora called it the rites of Kancharita. This rite is also in the Gospels and is explained by, uh, by Jesus. This rite, or this, uh, these rites are also explained in Tantra by the great master Padmasambhava. And the rite is quite simple. No matter how bad it gets, even if the entire world is plunged into warfare, disease, starvation, famine, and suffering, those who are truly committed to fulfilling their responsibilities to their innermost will always be protected and will have the basic necessities of life. Food, clothing, and shelter. You might not have the fancy car. You might not have an internet connection. You might not have electricity but you will have an opportunity to continue your spiritual work. And really, that's all you need. But of course, to acquire that, to earn that, to receive that right, you have to do your part. You have to be faithful to your innermost, to your Divine Mother, which means you have to be working daily to free your mind from its cages and prove your faithfulness. We have to abandon our faithless habits. Truly, we are faithless. We make a commitment, and the next minute, we break it. And we all do it, continually. To earn the rights of Kancharita, we have to become faithful consistent, committed, unwavering, serene. Do you have any questions? Question 
Yes, yeah, since karma is not fixed, many traditions give practices in order to clear karma, such as in Buddhism. They have many types of mantras, rituals, prostrations, and other types of exercises. Also in Hinduism, exercises that are given to students in order to work on karma. And the fundamental basis of those exercises is to guide the student to engage in an activity that is not selfish. Unfortunately, we tend to engage in all of our activities in a very selfish way. So while a, a practitioner of, let's say, Buddhism who learns to do prostrations is given the exercise to do a certain cycle of prostrations every day, they're given that so that they engage in that activity to purge certain types of karmas. And these are all effective, good exercises, but they are not deep. They do not penetrate into the reaches of the mind. The causes of our suffering are deep in the mind. In order to change suffering, you have to change the behavior that causes it. And you can't change that behavior if you don't identify it and understand it. It would be somewhat like having a deep-rooted cancer and taking aspirin. The aspirin can help you. And the painkillers can help a little bit. But they will not cure the cause of the disease. To cure our karma, we have to purge the mind of all its diseases. And there is only one way to do that through deep self-knowledge. Meditation. Self-analysis. something is comprehended on this level, is it also comprehended on, you know, the past life, and the future life? Is it kind of like converging and like, you know what I mean? I can't sure. really express. Yeah. And doesn't it kind of know what's going to happen, being that there's timelessness? In yes. Life? It's an interesting question. Um, to answer the question about time and its relationship with the being, what we need to understand is what Einstein explained in a very superficial way, which is that time is relative. And it's always relative to space. That's why in science we don't talk about time as a separate entity. We talk about space-time. You cannot separate them. The point of view of the being is very different from our point of view because the being is beyond the limitations of the space-time that we are in at this moment. The being is here. But we're unaware of that. On the other hand, the being is very aware of us. So that relativity is really important. But what's happening in other parts of the being is unknown to us because we're so asleep. For that to become known to us, we have to awaken. That process of awakening begins to reveal the timelessness of the being. It also begins to reveal how exactly it is that one can know the, f the past and the future. The implication is that by escaping the confines of time, you can also see the past. You can also see the future. But there's a great flexibility or, or um, impermanence and relativity to the nature of that perception. But it explains to us how we have certain prophecies, how we know that certain things will happen. All the great scriptures have predicted the times of the end. In, in particular, in relation with this class today, I put on the classroom uh, webpage the chapter 24 from the book of Matthew, in which Jesus explains in his words what I explained to you in the lecture. And what he explained was that everything that we see is going to be destroyed. And we don't know when, but we know it will happen. And if you're asleep, 
and distracted by your frivolous activities, you will be caught off guard and suffer the consequences. That's really the synthesis of what that chapter says. Jesus in that chapter is saying, pay attention, be present, work on yourself. It's going to happen. And likewise, we've had many other teachings on that matter. Also from the masters I already, met, I already mentioned, Samael and Vior and Padma Samava both gave prophecies. Their prophecies are coming to pass. Now. It's happening. Likewise, many other teachers and instructors in this tradition and other traditions have seen that these events will come to pass. And it's precisely because they're engaged in the work. They're engaged in escaping the confines of the mind, which is the confines of time. And through that, gain perception of reality. And part of that is being able to see what will come. Question yeah. That's a beautiful question. Um, feeling gratitude and that life is beautiful is a wonderful virtue. Truly, we should be extremely grateful for these moments. Life is a precious gift, and we need to take full advantage of it. We need to be grateful for that. Honestly speaking, truly speaking, we've got, we have received an incredible extension in these times. Um, the Third World War was already supposed to have happened. To state it bluntly. It should have happened already. And it hasn't. That's a gift from the gods. There are beings who are working very hard on our behalf in order to extend this time so that those of us who are seriously making effort can take full advantage of it. Because once the war happens, it will be extremely difficult to work. We, our time, our energy, and our resources will be much more limited. So we should be very grateful. We should definitely take full advantage of the moments that we have to work. We should be grateful and we should show that gratitude by working seriously on ourselves and helping others to do the same. More questions? Yes. Um, you, sp you spoke of uh, the Tao and the middle path, always watching the left, always watching the right. That's what they say, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, is the key then when it comes to eliminating an ego to do it with equanimity? Like, isn't the fa act of like going to sit down and recognizing that you have these problems, isn't that kind of like going to one side or the other? No. Because, like, I, um, I understand completely, but the intellect is kind of like... It. Yeah, I understand your question. In order to achieve true equanimity in the mind, true equanimity from meditation, one has to escape all forms of duality. The mind or the intellect is very dualistic, and it always is comparing option A and option B, opposites. So the mind, the intellect says, well... If there is serenity on one hand, then there must be chaos on the other hand. And this is an a intellectual perception. But it's actually unfounded. What is it that allows both of those to exist? What is it that provides the ground for which that duality can be there? It's the Tao. It's beyond both. So that's what we have to experience in meditation. It isn't a concept. It's an experience. And the only way you can experience that is to disengage from that process of comparison. When the mind reaches a state of rest, then you can experience that state. But as long as the mind is engaged in comparing, contrasting, trying to understand intellectually, it cannot grasp it. Really, truly, the process of meditation is not mind. It doesn't have to do with the intellect. It has to do with seeing what's beyond the intellect. So a bit of advice that I was given once that I like to share with students is if you really want to understand what meditation is, 
Try to understand what's between those thoughts. Look between them. Instead of focusing on the thought and what the thought contains, what happens between the thoughts? It's in that window that you can find the answer to your question. You can only do that through meditation, not through analysis. We had a question here. The, the rights that you had mentioned, mm -hmm. where can I read more of, of the, about the rights? Where can I, read I pretty much said everything there is to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> the rights of Kantrita are, are talked about in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus explains, observe the lilies of the fields and the birds of the air. That's, he's explaining that. Samuel M. Vero explains the rights of Kantrita in numerous lectures and also in the book, uh, One of the Christmas Messages, which is going to be published as Light from, uh, from Darkness, which will come out this year. Christ or no, that's, in, um, that's not in that book. That's in um, Christ's Will. Christ's Will is in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you said, you know, about analysis. But, you know, we always talk about how to extract a virtue from learning, you know, uh, comprehending of the ego. So we are actually, I don't even call it dualism, but there is, you know, uh, analysis there. How should we act in that same situation, right? Mm -hmm. Or how should we think, you know, so there is, you know, there is like analysis, I guess you could call it. Yeah, we need to analyze our behaviors and analyze the ego. But what we need to ultimately do is not be confused by the process of analysis. In the process of analysis, what can happen with students is that we get caught in the, the terms and the structures of our analysis. And we begin to think, what is I? What is self? Am I this? Am I that? And it's that questioning and that attempt to answer the question that can cause conflict. Because ultimately, we are the perceiver. We are the process of observing. And you can put any kind of labels and descriptions you want on that, but that's all intellectual. It's all philosophical. It's all vapor and dust. The true way to comprehend the ego is to see it for what it is, not what our analysis says, not the names and labels we give it in the intellect, and not the feelings we have in the heart or the way we sense it in the body. It's to see it through perception. And the process of perception is not dual. It's integral. It can see duality, and it can see beyond duality. And that's why we use the different tools, because the different tools apply in different contexts. It, it's confusing. To the intellect, well, to students, it's confusing, because we sound like we're contradicting ourselves. We say, in one hand, to be observer and observed, and on the other hand, we say there's no difference between the two. But it's a tool. I mean, it's a tool. Ultimately, the point is, you can never comprehend with the intellect. You cannot. The intellect cannot comprehend anything. All it can do is compare. It is not a tool of comprehension. The comprehension that we need can only be acquired through the heart. And that's when it's conscious. Cognizant. That's when the consciousness is awake it sees something for what it is, and it comprehends it in the heart, and something clicks. Something happens. You just know it. You can't explain it. And if you tried to explain it, it wouldn't make any sense. Comprehension is like that. It's in the heart, not the emotional brain. And this is the other difference. When we talk about the emotional brain, we talk about the three brains. They have levels, especially in the intellect and in the heart. They have levels. The way we experience our heart and intellect now, it's completely caged in subjectivity, in the sense of self that we have, in ego. But if you learn to awaken consciousness and learn how to use the tool of consciousness free of ego, you can also then begin to experience the superior aspects of the intellect and emotional centers. And the superior aspects are related with the spirit, with our divine soul. Those are forms of thought and emotion that have no sense of self like our sense of self here and now. It's different. It's a knowing 
It's knowledge. It can be a thought. It can be a feeling. But it is not terrestrial. It is not selfish. It doesn't have your name and your longings and desires. It's something else. And it's mysterious and it's beautiful. And it's something we used to all have, but we lost. Question. How, um, how can we approach uh, a sexual activity without desire? <laughs> oh, brilliant question. We have to approach sexual activity as we are now and learn about that. The only way you can approach sex without desire is when you have no desire left. And that state is only reached when all the desire has been comprehended. And that's a long path. Right now, we have a lot of desire. So we approach sexuality, and we observe ourselves as we are. And we learn to control and comprehend that. To not let the desire control us, but to control the desire. And start to comprehend it and remove it. To understand it. It's the only way. There are many who say, you have to go to sex without desire. It's impossible for us. We are consumed by desire. We are trapped in it. We have no choice but to deal with it. So we have to go into the act, in, true of anything. How do you go to work without pride? Right? How do you go to shop at the store without envy? How do you go into that rich neighborhood without envy? You can't. Because you have a lot of envy. You have a lot of pride. You have a lot of anger. So deal with it. Don't repress it. Don't avoid it in yourself. But look at it. When it comes up, look at it. Comprehend it. Look closely and perceive it for what it is. See how it functions. See how it acts. See how it impels you to act certain ways. And then see the consequences of those actions so that you can begin to comprehend it is true. Pride causes suffering. Lust causes suffering. Envy, gluttony, greed, laziness, all of these cause suffering. But you'll never understand it as long as it's just intellectual or a belief. You will only understand it when you see it in action in yourself. Having said that, even though the moments that are coming are going to be very difficult and painful, and we truly, sincerely wish there was another way. It's going to happen. So when it happens, let us learn. It's sad to say, but the truth of this humanity is, we really only learn when we suffer. It's sad that we're that far declined. But it's true. As long as we're getting what we want, we don't learn anything. We just want to keep getting what we want. It's when we get smacked down that we realize, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. When we're wounded and bleeding and suffering, and then we realize, God, that was a stupid thing for me to do. It's really the only time we learn. And unfortunately, all of humanity is going to be learning that way because we're that far gone. So when these events happen, let us learn from it. When you see people suffer, don't turn away. Learn. Because it could easily be you in their shoes. Every day we hear on the news and from our neighbors about people suffering terrible things. And we just brush it off. Oh, 50 more people died. Yeah, yeah I heard. It doesn't phase us at all. That's a mistake. That is a form of ignorance. If we were really conscious of our moment in time and space, if we were really present and aware of what's happening on this planet, all of us would be in tears. In tears. Because all of the people that are suffering in the world are people we've been related to before. When you understand the science and you understand the cycles of transmigration, you understand that mathematically 
it is quite logical that through our many lifetimes, we've had many parents, many siblings, many wives and husbands, many very good friends, and they're all over the planet now. People we have loved dearly. And they are suffering. And they are dying. And they are starving. And in pain. And we don't care. We just want to go and buy that new clothes or go shopping and get this and that. And we want to get that promotion at work. And we don't care about those people over there. That shows our level of development. It's very low. Someone who's awakening consciousness feels others. They begin to feel themselves in others. They begin to feel the suffering of others. That is a sign that you're awakening positively when your compassion begins to emerge. If you have a cold heart, you are asleep. And you might feel sympathy and you might feel bad for people from time to time, but that's not a sign of awakening. That can be empathy or sympathy. That's good. Compassion or bodhicitta is a very specific quality of an awakening mind, awakening consciousness. That's what bodhicitta means. A consciousness that is awakening that perceives reality and it perceives suffering for what it is. And it feels a lot of compassion. And spontaneously renounces actions that causes suffering. We need that. Humanity needs that. Humanity needs a lot of help. Even though there's going to be a lot of suffering and a lot of pain, a lot of good can come of it if we learn to transform it and help others. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Self-remembering is a state of consciousness that has to be experienced to be understood. It is elusive to the intellect because the intellect is not consciousness. But we try to put it in terms that you can understand so that you can learn qualities or, or approaches to it so you can identify it for what it is. Self-remembering at the beginning is a remembrance of being here and now, being in the body. It is to remember oneself, to be aware of oneself. That is the most basic, fundamental aspect of self-remembrance. But it's far more than that. When that remembrance of self is deepened and made continuous, it begins to embrace much more than one's self. Really, it becomes bodhicitta. Not only is it connected with our divine spirit, our inner Buddha, that's one aspect of self-remembering. It, it is a connection with God. It is a sense, not a thought, not a sensation, a sense. It is to sense divinity. Right now, we don't sense that, but we can. But to develop that, to, to sense that, you have to develop the ability to sense it. It doesn't happen automatically, and you can't force it. For example, in order to see, you have to open your eyes. And light pours in, and those electrons or photons are transformed into images by the brain. This process happens automatically. In self-remembering, you also have an organ that sees, but it's in the consciousness. It is not physical. It has nothing to do with your body. It has to do with the consciousness. It's not bound by the intellect or by the heart or by the body. But that organ is atrophied. It isn't like your eyeballs that you're born with. It is an organ that has no energy and no development. So it takes fuel and a process in nature for that organ to be energized and to develop itself. 
It doesn't happen overnight. It takes patience. But the more you are present here and now in your body, observing yourself, the more the sense of self-remembering grows. It grows in tandem with self-observation. That's why we describe them separately. They really are one thing. Ultimately, they are just the presence of consciousness that is observant here and now. But we talk about it separately because of this reason. Self-remembering is an expansion that's connected with the divine, that perceives and is here now and present. But it is not mere self-observation. It is more than that. So if you don't understand that, keep working at observing yourself. One technique that, that uh, helps many students is in the process of observing yourself to use your imagination. This can rapidly develop self-remembering to use your imagination consciously, like this. As you're observing yourself, you're in a given scenario. Let's say we'll start where you are right now. You are in a given place at a given time. Be aware of yourself. Don't change anything. Just observe. Be aware of everything you can. Feel your body. Feel the, all the sensations. Maybe there's some feelings, maybe not. Maybe there's some thoughts, maybe not. Be aware of listening. Be aware of seeing. Be aware of touching. Everything that you can sense, both outside and inside. This takes a lot of effort. You have to willfully do it. This is important to understand. It doesn't happen automatic. You have to be paying attention. This is the first part. This is self-observation to be here and now, aware of everything. The second part is, use your imagination. If you can't feel God directly, use your imagination to imagine God is here and now with you. Be creative, because really God is formless. Divinity has no form. You can imagine that divinity is the energy of everything, the light of everything. You can imagine that divinity is in the form of your divine mother or a great master who's standing right behind you or sitting with you and is always with you. It can be a great Buddha, a great angel who is with you constantly, always, protecting you, helping you, observing you, measuring what you do with his energy or her energy. That process of imagining empowers the consciousness and starts to reach out and realize, wait a minute, I can't just behave like I'm by myself all the time because God's here too. And that will very um, quickly help you to develop self-remembering. I think we should end there. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, Lord,